Hey folks, Jason Dukes, Dirt Race Life. We got our Camaro just about ready to go to the track this weekend. Last step, checking our setup and scaling the car. So this video right here is going to be about ride heights, our setup specifically on our Leaf Spring Camaro, scaling, and then also how to interpret scale numbers and make adjustments to your car. Stick around. So right when I'm going to scale the car, I like to do two things. I like to go around, I set my air pressure to what I expect it to be for the feature, features pain race. That's the one I want the car scaled to. I'll adjust in the heat and then come back to my scale numbers for the feature itself. Um, I take my stagger measurements um, at air pressure right before I scale. And then I like to take and just write them down. And I've already done this one. And I write them down on the wheels themselves. Um, so when I'm changing during the night, you know, I'm putting my durometer readings on the rubber on the back side of the tire, and then I'm putting my stagger numbers on the inside of the wheel. And, uh, and again, you can come up with a code for that, you know, if you're not wanting, uh, want, not wanting to share that information. But uh, I can't keep up with it on paper. I'll lose track of which wheel and which tire and what's going on. So I put it directly on the wheel. So I'm just going to go around, and I'm going to do this on all four. Um, and to me, and then we'll write it all up in here on the board, and that's the first step, always scaling. Um, you can really get yourself in trouble if you're mounting tires up that you haven't mounted before that are by supply, whether it be asphalt pull-offs or new Hoosiers or American Racers or whatever, but try to mount those up a different night from when you do this because if you mount them up, set the air in them, and then you're scaling over a period of two or three hours, that tire will change um, and it will grow. It's going to relax after it's been on the rim for a while. And so try to mount them up one night and then do your scale on the next. Make sure you go back, set your air again, and check your stagger right before you scale. That's the first step. So we'll go around and we'll do that next. All right, folks, here's where the money's at. So this is my Camaro setup. I've got my air pressure set. I've got all my stagger, my, my rollout on my tires has been measured. Um, and then I've wrote in some additional information what's currently on the car. Um, so let's go through this. Um, so let's just, so for example, these are asphalt pull-offs. And so, you know, air pressures, um, I'm running nine pounds on my left front, eight and a half pounds on my left rear, 13 pounds on my right front, 11 pounds on my right rear. This is a setup. These are my air pressures for a smooth, dry, slick, um, medium bank, not real aggressive, you know, bowl banking, anything like that. Um, but yeah, and on this setup right here, like that right front on that asphalt pull-off, that won't be on a beadlock. Um, I don't have a problem with rolling those off or anything, but I wouldn't go any lower. Um, and if a track was rough, I would have this blowed up to more like 15 pounds. Um, that 11 pounds on that right rear, that is on a beadlock. I'm running, this is on 1510 rims. And so like this setup is 3035 Hoosiers on um, three of these and a 3045 on the right rear is what this currently is um, and then you see these rollouts um, so you know 81 and 5 eighths um, 81 and an eighth 83 and three quarters 83 and a half um, so you see my stagger difference right here on the front and the back so i've got roughly two inches here on the front and i've got a little more than two about two and three eighths here on the back is what that stagger currently is I'll vary on stagger. I'm not real worried. I always want to make sure I have a little bit of stagger on the front, but I'm not real worried about it. I, I pay more attention to my scale numbers than I do my stagger on the front. And I just use it if I need to, you know, to, to change the numbers, especially at the track. You know, I'll take and put a taller right front or a shorter right front on at the track if I need to put some bite into or take out of the car. That's a quick way that you can do it with more than just changing the air pressure. Remember, you don't want to change your air pressure more than two or three pounds um, trying to change the weight of the car. You can really get yourself in trouble because you start making your tire handle differently. Your car's going to drive different, so avoid that if you can. All right, let's talk about springs. I'm running AFCO uh, five and a half, nine and a half uh, inch springs on the front, on cups, stock position uh, cups. I'm not running weight jacks because the shocks are through the center. I'm running 900 pound on the left front, 800 on the right front. So that is a right front soft setup. I will say, this is as soft as I can get without running a bump on the shock. 
When I, I have run softer, I've run a 750, I've run 700, but I absolutely had to have a bump system set up or I would smack the lower control down, arm down on the frame really easy. And even at this, um, this setup, you know, I have to be on a smooth, dry, slick, you know, track. I can't be on a real aggressive or rough track. And I can't slam the right front off into a, you know, off into the berm or anything like that, or I will go down on it. So I'm right at the limit. And that's with the right front on the scales weighing like 650 pounds, somewhere in there. So I'm, I'm right at it at 800 pounds on a Camaro. All right. So you've been warned about running real soft on the Camaros. That's to me, that's as, as soft as I can get. Um, on the rear, 200 pound on the left rear. I got a 175 on the right rear. Uh, this is with me running like uh, 53 to 54 percent rear on a 3,200 or 3,000 pound uh, car according to kind of where I'm running. Um, I'm usually always making sure I either hit the 3,200 or the 33 or 3,000 or 3,200 pound total weight. Uh, keep in mind this right here I can't I would not go softer than this and depending on the total weight of your car and what your rear percentage is you know, uh, you may need to be at 225 and 200 or 250 and 225. How do you figure that out? Well, um, one way that's real easy to look at is just to look at on the scales what your weight of your rear end is. So like for example, on a 200 pound spring, you know, my left rear, I'm sitting, you know, 800, 900 pounds in that area on a 200 pound spring. And so if I was in a 3,400 pound car, well, if I had 53 or 54, 55% rear weight or more, and this left rear was weighing 1,000, 1,100, 1,200 pounds, according to where the bite was at, I definitely would need more than a 200 pound spring. You know, if it was at 1,000 pounds on my left rear, I'd probably be on a 225. If I had the, if the left rear weight was all the way up at 1,200 or 1,300 pounds, it was really this crazy high, you know, left rear percentage going on here that worked for the car. I would think that spring would be, need to be up in the 250 uh, area, just depending on bite. Same thing on the right rear. You know, I'm running a little less over here, but we also weigh less over here. Um, so just keep that in mind. It's not just the total weight of the car, but it's also just how much of that weight is on your rear suspension. Because you could have a car that weighs 34 or 3,500 pounds, but if you're in a class that, for example, has a maximum rear percentage weight of only 49 or 50%, you don't necessarily need to put a lot more spring on the rear because you're not putting all of that weight to the rear like you would if you ran, you know, a high rear percentage. Um, so food for thought on that. Um, on the shocks on the front, I have been really happy uh, with these Bilstein stock. Um, these are non-rebuildable stock shocks, 100 bucks a piece. Really happy with them for what they, for what they cost. But uh, this left front is a Bilstein AK. It's a digressive, you know, so it's, it, you have to think about like a curve, whether the curve is flat or it's curved upward or it's curved downward in relationship to the speed that the shock moves compared to the strength of the resistance. That's what digressive, linear, and progressive is referring to. So this is a 197 rebound, 154 compression on my left front. Um, on my right front, I am running a strong tie-down shock, and these are gas shocks, by the way, but I'm running the same Bilstein AK, but this is, a, this is a linear, and it's 393 rebound, 172 compression, and this AK series shock that I'm running here, this is actually purposed for metric, and I'm running these on my Camaro. On the left rear, I've got an Integra. This is a non-rebuildable, just a $90 shock. I started out with the first one. I got it used from a friend, and I've stuck with it. I've I've run. I, I will run a three three, a four four, and a five five. I played around with the left rear, but I like this. This works on dry slick really well. Um, this is a three one zero dash four two one nine eight dash two. It's eight compression. It's two rebound. It's an oil shock, not a gas shock. Um, like I said, low cost, non rebuildable. It's a good little low shock. On my right rear. Run a little bit better shock. I've got a AFCO 19 series, uh, 1994 uh, oil shock. That's about a $170 shock. Um, and I keep this shock right here, I take to the track like a 3.3, a 4.4, and a 5.5. Five. 
and that is subject to change i will say i do play around with that based on what's going on on the track i know all of these shocks none of these shocks are a match set you know this is a digressive this is a linear you know this is an oil non-rebuildable this is a rebuildable shock um you know that's gas that's oil they're they're very different from each other but you know in my opinion it you know go to the track try to take the resources take shocks with you and stuff try to give the car what it's asking you for even you know like okay so fine it's not a match set and it's not you know what some shock builder has put me on and the shock guys they're good and, and they can put you on a set and it may be similar to this and it may be something completely different but it's matched and it works um so it's a little bit of trial and error there when you're doing like this and you're just working through your resources and everything you've got to if you do this make sure that you're taking a lot of options with you to the track looking look to go to the play days look to go in in the hot laps and the things like that because you know you can chase your tail on this and send these you know like when you get all these shocks here's another thing you're going to run into too on these shocks to be aware of is you know, an Integra 8.2 oil shock is not going to be the same as an AFCO, you know, 19 series oil shock. These things will be drastically different, you know, when you map them out. And so, you know, sp you know, spend the money, get with, a, get with a shock guy. And so, you know, just be honest with him. You know, if you can't afford to buy, you know, a match set of shocks, you know, ask if, you know, hey... You know, could I pay, you know, to have all of my shocks rated, you know, the ones that are rebuildable, let them go through them and put fresh oil in them and rebuild them and rate everything and get sheets on all your shocks so you know compared to each other what they are. And then you can start building yourself a plan at your budget, um, you know, and, you know, and like I said, you're going to spend a little bit of money, but, um, but you can, I mean, what's the alternative? You know, I would rather spend another twenty dollars, you know, on a non-rebuildable shock, you know, and have a rate plan for it and know whether or not it's good and where I could use it, you know, because you know, a used shock that's non-rebuildable, well, that's not worth five or ten dollars, you know. So you might as well throw it away. So yeah, if, it, if it's a good-looking shock, there's no dents, no dings, you know, it's not beat all to pieces. Then you know, yeah, spend fifteen or twenty dollars and. You know, have it rated. You may have somebody who will rate your shocks. Like if you take them 10 shocks, you know, they may would rate your shocks out for you at $10 a piece or something. Remember, they, they've got a business to run. It's got to make sense for the overhead of their shop too. So keep that in mind. But, you know, talk to somebody about it. I think it's worth it. Um, so next up, we're going to put the car on the scales and get these scale numbers rolled in here. Okay, so I've got all my scales plugged in here. Um, zero them out and set the car down on them. Lift does make it easier. Um, I do have the car in gear, um, but I make sure, like I said, when I sit it down, I, I sit it down, make sure that it's it's free. I don't pull the axles out. Um, so I'll come back to this. Technically, if you did this perfectly, you would take one of the rear axles out where you could have no bind between your two rear wheels being hooked together. You would take the shocks loose. Specifically, you would take any gas shocks loose. The only shock that I've ever taken loose to scale where I could see the difference. Um, I do have a uh, AFCO extremely high nitrogen pressure left rear shock that I have run at times and I may run it on this cool car build that we're doing, that's like a 200 PSI shock, I can see that on the scales. And I'll unhook that because that shock doesn't act like that on the track when it's extending because the, you know, the valving of the shock itself is, is affecting over time. So I do unhook an extreme gas shock, I would, I would do that. These shocks right here, um, no, I don't unhook them. Technically, if you're gonna do scaling perfectly, you would have no shocks hooked up. You would have one of your axles out in the back. That would be the right way to do this. I got where I scale the car without me in it, um, just cause jumping in and out of the car, I do it all by myself and that's really difficult. Um, but I will jump in the car, even though I'm gonna give away just how big I am when I do that. But I'm gonna, I'm gonna jump in the car and I'll show those numbers before this is over. But yeah, like right now, 719 on the left, whoa, 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 whoa. Hold on. 
Before we do that, one thing I do do, I do believe in bouncing the car. And I don't bounce it all to death. But I'm going to do the test. I'm going to make sure I roll it back and forth on the axles. I got the front bounced or the back bounced. I'm gonna, all I'm trying to do is make sure that it's not like sitting there bound up somewhere. You know, something's got a pinch in it. Um, that's, all I'm, that's all I'm trying to avoid. Yes, I have done this before. Oh, that's a stick shot. Um, I have done this right here before and seen the scale numbers change 30 or 40 pounds on one wheel. So, bounce your car. Now, you know, it doesn't take a lot, but you want everything to just settle. Because when you sit it down, it can kind of cup and bite into those, um, to those scales. And that's where, you know, a set of floating pads, yeah, if you can afford them, absolutely. Uh, you know, that's where your scale is sitting in a box and it lets it move around and it keeps that bind from showing up. So just going through these numbers here, uh, with me not in the car right now, left front, 724 pounds, right front, 633 pounds, the left rear is 728 pounds, the right rear is 711 pounds. So I've got 17 pounds of bike is all this car's got in the right rear right now on it. Um, and that's me not in the car, that's going to change when I get in the car. I'm a great big old boy, that's going to change that number. Um, so like right now I'm sitting at 51.4% um, rear and my right side is 52%. So those numbers will change. Uh, I tip, uh, week to week I'm doing it now with me not in the car because I'm by myself. And um, you know because what I'm doing is, is I'm just I'm checking you know like what my bite number is. And this is a little bit low. The last time we ran this, we made a few adjustments on it. I made some adjustments at the track when I was at the Talladega Ice Bowl because we were running our asphalt pull-offs on 8-inch wheels instead of 10s. Um, had a few things, you know, that we kind of adjusted on a little bit. So I'm going to go up a little bit on that bike number. But uh, I've wrote those on the board, and we're going to turn around, and I'm going to get in the car, and then we're going to see what they are. I don't even think I could fit in there, did you? And I can tell you, I can get out that passenger side. Do not build a car that you cannot get out the passenger side. We call that a death trap. Don't build a death trap. Uh, all right. So I'm in the car. I usually, I'm by myself, so I give it a little shake. I let everything settle down. And let's see where we're at. So I wrote these down here, 822, 26.2. No scales are pretty good for what they cost, but those Proform scales that I got, I mean, they are the, the lowest cost scales and uh, they don't give you like your rear and all that. You just gotta do the math on it. Um, so yeah, I'm, I'm looking, I'm in the market. I'm going to get some new scales probably this year and next year. 792 pounds. 25.3%. All right, so rear, 28.2 and 25, 53. All right, so rear is 53.5%. Left is 26 and 28 is... 54, 2 and 2, 54.4%, all right, 53.5, 54.4, bite is add 84 plus 8, so I have 92 pounds of bite. All right, so what's missing? What number did I not put on here? I didn't write the cross down. That's right. And so look, 28.2 and 20.4 um, is I'm at 48.6 on cross. And this is an opinion, okay, that I have. 
and I'm going to share here. If you're paying attention to cross and you're running a dirt street stop, you'll start chasing a cross number and you will sacrifice your setup to do it. Because in my opinion, on a dirt car, left and rear and bite are your numbers. Because your cross, what I found is, is that you can run less rear, you know, less rear and less left and a lot of bite. Um, it's like you've got a seesaw. You know, you can have a lot of rear and a lot of left and less bite, or you can have less of these numbers and more bite. And so your cross numbers, it's, it's, they're, they're, they're going back and forth. And so you start, you're sitting here trying to juggle all of this. And in my experience, when I st stopped chasing cross, stopped saying like in my mind, like, oh, my cross should be more than 50%, you know, or I should be, my cross should be, you know, 49 or 51 and that kind of stuff. I was screwing my ride heights. I was going all over the place. I was changing springs. I was doing all kind of stuff, chasing this cross number. And I, th I think I lost time and getting a car, you know, set up to be able to drive to the front. Um, and that's, that's my personal experience in it. Leave a comment. Let me know. I mean, and I know it's very different for asphalt. So I'm strictly speaking dirt experience here. But this 92 pounds of bike for me right here, this is my dry slick setup. And this is a little bit light on bike. And let me look at my notes. So without me in the car, without me in the car, um, that bike number, and I wrote it down here, 728 and 711, so it's 17 pounds without me in the car. And let me see if I wrote it down. Yeah, without me in the car at my final setup, I had 48 pounds of bike is where I was at. And I've switched tires around, I've switched rims around, um, and I think I turned on some, some cups while I was down at Talladega last. And, you know, for those reasons, so like, a couple of things were a little bit different. Um, I was running a little bit less rear. I was running about around 52% of rear. And I got my rear up to 53.5. They asked me to add, they asked me to bolt weight on at Talladega. And so when I went down there, I was running at, uh, you know, 52% rear. And so that car now, I'm probably got a full load of fuel on the car because it's still got the same fuel. And I, I got put out of the feature race early. So I still probably got a pretty full load of fuel on it. And I bolted on, I think I did bolt on about 100 pounds. I was right at 3,000. I think they asked me to go to 3,100 with the car, which I did. It didn't, it didn't make a difference to the car. It, it helped it, to be honest, because I put it all on the rear. Uh, so, what am I going to do? The next thing I'm going to do is I'm going, I'm going to put some more bite in the car, but we've got to figure out. So, how do we put bite in a car? Well... We can turn on cups and we can change shock lo or we can change shackle locations if we got multi holes on the rear of a leaf spring car. But what do I want to do? Which do I want to go up on the right front or down on the left front? Um, or do I want to move the left rear shackle hole location down? Or do I want to move the right rear shackle location up? So in uh, every one of those things will change this. And since I made changes at the track, I suspect that my ride heights are probably a little different from last. So the next thing to do, so you see what I did here in order. I set all the air on the car. I got all my staggered numbers and everything like that. Got the tires on it and stuff. Then I turned around, um, documented where I was at with everything. Then I put it on the scales and saw where I was at. And now I'm going to measure the car because... You set ride heights and everything, and then you turn around and you scale it. Well, now you're changing your ride heights. So there's an order of events to go through. For me, this is the right order to go through in progression. Um, and if I was first starting out with a car and it was a first build, or I just got the car, I am going to first get the ride heights close is the first thing I'm going to do. Um, you know, I, I am. I'm not going to... I am going to change that order, but I'm still going to end up coming back to this when we get into the actual tuning of it. So let's talk about ride heights. That's next. When it comes to measuring the front ride heights, I just use a square. So this is a 12 inch steel ruler square. It's got a base on one end and I set the ruler flush on one end where I can just sit it on the floor. 
And so that's what I do. I sit it down and I sit it where the ruler is just going across my front lower control arm bolt right here. And then I'll just take a dry erase marker and reach in and I'll mark that center of that bolt just like that. And then I can pull it out and look at the ruler and that's telling me. So I'm using, I'm using that center of that bolt um, on the front right here. And so that's not the bottom of the frame, but it is a very accurate place to get measurement. And this difference between these two bolts on the, on the front there is going to tell you exactly how much angle left or right you have in your car. And so I'm going to do that on both sides and then uh, write those down on the board. So on the rear here now, I do do Camaro significantly different than probably a lot of people do. Um, the one consistent place on a Camaro rear end for me is the front eye bolt of the leaf spring. And um, I can't really show it on the video with the tape measure uh, or with this ruler right here up in there actually at the bolt. But it's at eight and three eighths here. And so I just mark it right there. And uh, that's where it's at. And so I do this on both sides on the back. Um, just to keep in mind, this bolt sits lower in the frame um, on the rear than what the front is. So these numbers are real close to the same front to back, but this car does have about two inches of rake in it. But these are consistent places that you can measure. And I can go from one car to another and the frames are made slightly different, different. but where that bolt's at, that will tell me the true rake in the car. So that's how we do that. I've got my ride heights recorded now, and you see the car, um, the ride heights are very flat to each other. Eight and a quarter on both the left front and right front, and I've got eight and a quarter on the left rear and eight and three eighths on the right rear. Um, and so this car probably does have, it's, the right's probably up just a little bit, and it's just difficult for me to measure, because um, that's only an eighth inch difference right there. So this car is not sitting flat. You have to keep in mind um, these measuring points that I use for a Camaro and for any Camaro, uh, I consider to be the most repeatable with differences going on with different people's frames and how they built the cars and stuff because I'm in the center of the bolt on the lower control arms and then on the rear end, I'm in the center of the bolt for the front of the leaf. And so regardless of how the frame is and where your rail ends up below or if it's rushed away and been replaced with something or whatever, these numbers um, represent what would actually affect how the car would drive. And so that's why I use them. If you took a straight edge and you were to like put under my car, if you took a six foot straight edge and ran down through there with like the front stub across to the rear, this is like two inches. This car does have like two inches of rake. It just has to do with how that these bolts are at a much higher point in the front than what like these bolts are in the rear. So that's about two inches of rake in that car. Um, so don't let that, don't let that confuse you. And I'm, I'm looking at this and this car is too flat for me. I like for my car to be over onto the right side. So I like my right side to be just a touch lower than the left on this Camaro. Um, that works better for me. And I don't want the right front though to be um, any lower than it is. And I'm looking at this and I'm so now it's like you're trying to figure out like, Okay, we want to add some bite into the car. We know we can't move weight to do that. We have to do that in ride heights in, in the jacks and the shackles. That's how we have to do that. And so when I look at this, I know if I want, what I'm wanting ultimately is I'm wanting for this left rear tire to weigh more on the ground than the right rear. And I want to increase it by another 20 to 30 pounds here at least. All right, I want this up at like 120 to 130, somewhere in there, is where I'd be happy with this and a feature uh, dry slick setup. And so there's several ways that we can accomplish this. And you have to think about this. Think about this like it is a four leg chair. And um, when I say that is, is if you were to make this leg on the chair taller and it pushed down more, um, that's gonna get heavier and then the opposite leg on the right front would get heavier and these two would get lighter. And so it's, it's like a seesaw. If I'm, you know, if I run, you know, if I run a weight jack on a coil car down on the left rear, then that in turn is picking the car up on the left rear. I'm picking the car up on the left rear. 
That's taking and pushing the car down on the right front, which is making that weight go up as well. All right? And it's having the opposite effect on these two because as I'm picking up here, I'm, in essence, what I'm doing is, is I'm lifting weight off of the left front and the right rear. Okay, so that's one thing we can do. If we took the right rear and we looked at it, and we said, well, if I wanted to increase my bite on the left rear, what would I do to the right rear? Well, if I let the right rear down, if I was to take a weight cup and turn it up, where that the spring wasn't being pressed down on as hard, what that would do is that would take and it would apply less pressure on the right rear, which in fact would apply less pressure on the left front. The left front would get lighter, the right rear would get lighter, the left rear and the right front would now be carrying more of the load, so I'd increase on my weight here and I would increase on my weight here. Same effect works up here on the right front. If I went down on the right front, that is also going to press down more on the left rear my weight would go up. If on the left front, I would go, I would come back off the jack on the left front so that I'm pressing down less on the left front, that in effects less on the right rear, and so now that creates more weight. So I can move any of these four and it would make my bike go up if I moved this one to be more weight or the right front to be more weight or the left front to be less or the right rear to be less, all of those would result in this bite number increasing. If I wanted to decrease it, it would be the exact opposite. Now, when we're setting up a car and we're looking at ride heights, that's when, that's why that, you know, as far as tuning it week to week or making slight changes, I believe the right approach is to scale the car and then determine your ride heights to figure out which way you want to go because I know I want to increase my bite and then I turn around and now that I know what I'm wanting to do, I'm wanting this to weigh more, then I say, well, what heights do I want to change? I don't really want this eight and a quarter to go down anymore, um, but I want the car over on the right. And since I want it over on the right without this going down, I'm gonna pick up the left side uh, and so picking up this left side over here, I'm looking at this eight and a quarter on the rear and I've already checked and my deck height, I know that I can come up on my deck height um, as much as two more inches. As the, if I was to run this car in a crate racing USA class race, that left uh, rear corner could be as high as 40 inches and it's down close like 38 inches now. So. I believe my best solution for me to get my number I'm, I'm after is to take and go down, you know, one shackle hole. So I got this shackle, you know, on this left rear right here. Right now, it's in that hole. I'm going to move it to that hole. That's one inch of difference right there at the actual end of the leaf spring. That's going to create a half inch of pressure at the rear end itself. And when I say a half inch of pressure, it would be like turning a, a weight jack down on a cool car by a half of an inch. You know, think about it like that. Um, and so that in effect is gonna make my bite number rise. I'll get a big change in ride height right here. I'm gonna get some change in ride height on my right rear because when I pick up on the rear end, on either side, I am lifting the rear end as a whole. So, so I'm, gonna take, I'm gonna take and apply you know, this tire is going to get heavier. I'm going to push down harder. The rear end is going to raise up. But at the same time, that's taking weight off that right rear, and it's going to rise as well. Um, I may pick up the left front just a touch, and it may want to compress the right front. We'll have to see where we're at. Because we may have to do a juggling act where that we'll pick this up initially, and then I may have to come back up with the cup. And that's where this, that's where a lot of people get lost on setup, because you can kind of chase it. You know, I could initially make a big change right here. Then I'm coming back and on this cup, I don't want to be any lower, so I'm turning my cup down to press back on my right front. Well, I may find that, you know, hey, that made too much bite for the change I had. And so then you're coming back across and you're saying, okay, you gotta look back, look back at your four points. You know, 
I may actually take and say, well, I want to pick up on both of these just a touch, and that way I can take a little bit back off of this. So you're balancing. And you have to go through this, and that's why I say if you set up and you put your car on the scales every week and you make minor adjustments, after a while it gets where it just it comes natural to you kind of what to do. Um, so let's move that hole down on that shackle on that left rear right there. And then I'll rescale the car and remeasure the car. And we'll put those numbers up on the board and see where we're at. So I just took and I just dropped my shackle down here. I'm running really long shackles. That's another one of the things that... Uh, that I do that has to do with the angle of the leaf springs. We can't cover but so much in one video though. So we're gonna save that one for another day. All right, so I'm gonna look right here. And I can tell y'all, in or out of the car, bite like this right here. I hit it at 17 and then when I got in the car, 17 turned into 95. Um, and then I changed the bite. If 17 went to 27, 95 will go to 105. I can just tell you that from experience. I've, I've learned that. So now I've went from 17 pounds to 41 pounds of bite. So we're, we're in there. That, that was one hole. It was a one inch, there's one inch spaces on those holes and that was one hole on the left rear. I'm gonna jump in the car, get the numbers again, put them back, I'm gonna wipe off the numbers we had, put the new numbers on, and then I'm gonna take and take all the measurements for ride height again. We'll see where we're at. So I went on this left rear, went down one shackle there, uh, one shackle hole, and I ended up in actual ride height. I moved it one inch on the shackle itself, but in real ride height, I got three eighths of an inch increase is what I got right here. Um, now, when I picked up on that left rear look over here, the right rear also came up. I came up from eight and three eighths up to eight and a half, okay? And then on the left front, how did it affect it? I picked up, I could tell there was a slight change. I believe I'm at eight and five sixteenths down this left front. The right front didn't look like it moved. It may have, it's just in the margin of error. It looked like I'm still right at eight and a quarter. In reality, I probably did compress that slightly. Um, what I was looking for here is I wanted to be slightly higher on my left front than my right front. I like for the car sitting at ride height with me in it. I like for the car to be just slightly over on the right side. That works for me. I've gotten happy with that. And you see, I, I'm showing a 16th here that I can measure on the front, and eighth inch I can measure on the rear here is, is what this is showing. Now let's look at our scale numbers and see what happens. That was one change um, on this left rear moving a shackle one inch. And you'll see, let's just start with the left rear. So I picked up weight on this left rear by doing that because when I went down a shackle hole, that leaf spring is pushing down harder on that tire holding the car up. I went from 884 up to 902. Since I'm pushing down more on the left rear, that has taken some of the pressure off of the right rear. The same thing that made the ride height rise on the right side also took weight away. So now I went from 792 down to 775. Look on the left front. I was on the left side of the car when I pushed, like I said, I went down on that shackle hole on the left side and it also lifted the left side overall. And that's why you saw me gain a 16th of an inch in ride height. And then also in weight, I went from 822 down to 806. Picking up on that left rear, I pushed harder on that right front by doing it. Look, I went from 639 to 658. And then as far as the measurement goes, again, my common sense is telling me I probably have compressed slightly right here and it's just not really measurable at such a slight amount, but it did. Percentage numbers track to the same thing, 26.2, went you know, down to 25.7. My 20.4 right here went up to 21. And then the left rear from 28.2 to 28.7. Um, and then the right rear, 25.3 down to 24.7. An interesting point right here, and this is a concept to, to get another one of them get locked in your brain. We did not physically move weight. 
Therefore, our rear percentage and our left percentage should not have changed. Um, only way you change rear or change left is to physically change where something is positioned in the car or where weight is bolted onto the car. And this, uh, like I'm 53.5 to 53.4. The scales I have only read to a tenth of a percent. I don't have a resolution. That's a margin of error. That's one tenth of a percent. So, you know, I'm on my scales and it'll flicker between four and five or three and four like that. So that's margin of error. I'd say that's the same for rear. On the left, 54.4 state 54.4. If you are changing your ride heights and you know your cups and stuff when you're scaling and you're seeing these numbers change, pause and look for a bind in the car. Something's going on. You've got a rubber somewhere hung up. There's, there's something weird happening with your car. See if you, see if you can find that because um, you probably do have a problem. These numbers should not change. Um, so that can be an indicator of something you need to look for. And then look right down here at the bike. We went from 92 pounds up to 127. And so you see that was a shift between both of them. You know, a, a, an increase here and a decrease there that together resulted in a change of 127 pounds of difference between the two. So, so I know that this car right now in, in my shop is about 60 to 70 pounds light to the next race that I'm gonna run. I'm gonna run this car in a 3,200 pound class race the next race. I am not, however, gonna bolt that weight on in the shop. And this is a suggestion that I have um, for other racers. Scales will vary track to track and I want them all to be accurate. I'd love for us to all be on you know, a level playing field, but I can tell you there are seven different tracks that I normally go to throughout the season. Some don't have scales. They have weight requirements and no scales, no way to enforce it. Um, and then some have scales and the scales just don't work. And then some scales are inaccurate and some scales actually are accurate. And I, I mean, it's just, that's reality. And that's probably not just in my local area. That's, that's probably pretty common. And so if I go to a track and their scales weigh heavy or they weigh light or something, I, I always weigh your car when you go, you know, to a track you haven't been at, you know, go and scale your car and be prepared if you need to take weight off or add weight on. Um, I would not take weight off this car, but I'm going to be prepared to add weight if I need to. And uh, the, the, the people that are racing at the same track week after week, they know the condition of the scales and they know how their cars weigh to it. And so if you just assume that you're running against you know, a track that's got a good set of scales that are accurate, and they say you have a 3,200 or 33 or 3,400 pound weight rule, and you show up weighing that much, and then come to find out their scales, you know, weigh way heavy, you know, and your car comes in at 36 or 3,700 on their scales, I guarantee you those, those racers that you're racing against, that's, that's the only place they're racing, they don't weigh that much. They're making sure they just hit the number they need to on that scale. So take it with you, but be prepared to make the change at the track. It can make a pretty big difference, especially if that weight would push you outside of where your optimal setup is on your car. So I do suggest that's food for thought to keep in mind. So I consider this complete for what I'm going to take to the track to theoretically run in the feature race. And um, depending on, like I said, I may add 60 or 70 pounds to the rear of this car. I can tell you that, you know, I will pick up this rear percentage right here. I'll get that slightly over 54%. My ride heights will change slightly. I'll probably lose a 16th of an inch, maybe an eighth of an inch of ride height right here on the rear, um, but it'll be even. It'll be even and the car will drive just the same. I'll get a little bit more forward bite off the turn is, is about what will happen. I'll take this board right here. Write this down in the book, put today's date. This is my setup for the feature. And then let's talk about briefly as far as show up at the track, um, assess, like I said, find out what's going on with the scales. Uh, I don't ever make any change to a car based on practice and hot laps unless it is at a show you're already on a final finish of the track when you're practicing. So like if you have a practice session and you're going out onto a track that is, 
you know, being reworked during the day and it's already, you know, smoothed off or dry slick, hooked up, you know, then yeah, you, you probably could gain some information from that. But now on a typical Saturday, Friday night or a Saturday night race, for me, a practice hot lap session is going to be on a track that's going to still be greasy or it's going to have a lot of a lot of slough on it that's, that's blowing off. And how my car acts is not how it's going to be acting in the heat and feature. And for that reason, I typically try to not even use those unless I've made a big change on my car. I'm looking at something mechanical to make sure that it's okay. I'm not even going to take my car out in the hot laps. If you need the experience um, and just getting out on the track and getting to for the car, do it. But if you know what the car is going to do, I think it can work against you because you know your car may act squirrely on a track that is really not in good condition at that point yet and then that kind of gets in your head and that can cause you like if you're sitting on the pole in the heat race and that's the next time you go on the track that can cause you to hesitate or to not run the car the way you need to into the turn and uh, and you end up in second place just because the track got in your head because you ran in the hot lap so keep that in mind now, when I'm looking at the heat, I'm trying to figure out what's going on in the heat. Early in, uh, I'm in the southeastern U.S., so early in the season and late in the season, um, it's real common for a track to still have a lot of bite in it during the heat for the tracks that I race at. And so, yes, I may, you know, I may make a change. Um, if I think a track is really hooked up and it's going to be hooked up good for me in a heat race, um, I take and like I said, I'll keep an AFCO, a three, a four, and a five with me, and I may take and come that take this eight two right here off the left rear, and I may take and put you know a a four four on this left rear, and I may put a three three or a four four here on this right rear. I may swap these swap shocks around just for a heat race, um, and take this this hold up shock off um, of this left rear. Um, because I'm trying to slow this down um, is what I'm doing. I'm trying to slow this down because if a track, uh, from experience, if a track is real hooked up and I've got this 8-2, this 8 compression 2 relief on the left rear, uh, I'll get into the corner initially good because it's going to keep that left rear weight on, that left, that left tire's dragging. It's going to turn me in. But when I pick the throttle up, I'm going to get too much left too fast remember um, shocks are just timing devices and so this eight compression two rebound it's going to let me have all of that left rear the second i pick the gas up and so if a track is really hooked up that can make me aware that i get a mid-turn push mid-turn push can push me straight to the rear of a heat race um, and for that reason you know i may swap this out um you know and like i said i may I'll never take and put this over to the right rear, but I will take and just pull both these shocks off or pull this shock off specifically and go to, uh, if, the if I think the track is really, re like really rough, then I may even put like a 5.5 five on the right rear and a 4.4 four on the left rear. Um, in that case, if I, you know, if I think I'm just going to be blowing through some, uh, some ruts or something, you know, or if I, you know, if you get a track, it's not really ruts, but if you get a track that's like what I call chunky, where that it's gotten tacky, but you got it's grooving up, and, and um, you know you're kind of blowing through some berms before you get to the top one. Um, yeah, I'll put a five five on that right rear in that case. I won't ever change my front shocks. These are stock location shocks, and they're a pain in the butt to change. There's probably a gain if you put the effort in there. There's cases where I I know that this tie down on this right front probably if I came off with it um, on a on a hooked up track I could probably be better. But, um, you know, that's, that's where I'm at. I'll leave it. I will make a change here if I need to. And only if the track's hooked up. Middle of the summer, here in the southeastern U.S., where I'm at, tracks are typically already getting slick and, you know, getting black coming off of middle off the turn. And so I'll run, I'll run this shock right here in the heat race as well. So that's the whole story right there on my Camaro. No shadows, no smoke and mirrors. That's the big picture. All right, folks, so that covers setup and scaling um, for our Camaro and scaling in general as a process. For me, this is something that I try to always do one night of the week before we're going to go racing. 
feel like it's really important to do this on a regular basis. It helps you to have a good picture of exactly where your car's at and what even minor changes do to your setup. That's gonna turn around and empower you when you're at the track to know exactly what to change to get the desired effect on your car you're after. So I strongly encourage it. You know, if you're racing every Saturday night, you know, I think one night of the week, if you can get it on the scales, get it on the scales. Go through, make minor changes, document it. it you're gonna just learn more and more about the car and your setup. Now, I went through everything on this Camaro, no smoke and mirrors, no hiding anything. We didn't cover every nook and cranny of it. There are, there are a few more things that we could get into, just the time limits of a video, we couldn't get there. This setup on this car, I'm strongly encouraging you, don't necessarily say, well, I'm gonna do exactly this. Instead, take from it, study it, compare it to your setup, because I really believe it's one thing, it, it, took, it took several years for me to kind of grasp this, but it's, you can't change one or two things. It, it's, it, think of it like this, shocks, springs, ride heights, bite, you know, tires, tire pressure, these are all instruments in an orchestra, and you have to get them to sing in tune, okay? And so, you know, like I'm running a real soft setup on the front, but I'm also running, you know, like a composite, you know, leaf spring on the back. Um, I'm running a really long shackle. You know, I'm running a very aggressive tie down on the right front, but I'm also running a mild, you know, rebound strong shock on the left front. So it's, you know, it's got its things that are working together and it has its limitations. This car does not like a rough track. And so you say, well, Camaro is a rough track car and a metric car is a dry slick car. Well, it's funny, get this car up to the speed where they can keep up on a dry slick track and it starts showing me some of those characteristics, such as wanting to bottom out or get upset, you know, on a real rough track. And so I am changing this setup depending on which track I go to. So be aware of that. Take from it what'll help you, but don't take it as the gospel, you know, that it's gonna work exactly the same on your car. So you've been warned. I don't wanna see somebody go in the wrong direction. We're trying to put information out there to help move you in the right direction. More consistent car, finish further up front, less tore up parts. Um, that's gonna create more, uh, less cautions, more fans in the stand, better racing, that supports our sport. So that's what we're all about, and I hope as many of you as I can get to get on board with that, please do. Dirt Race Life, Dream Build Drive, we've got a Facebook site, same thing, Dirt Race Life. Check it out, what we're doing is we're linking up all of our videos there as well to make sure that we're getting the information out there. So I appreciate y'all's time, thank you for watching. Hit the subscribe button, it would help me tremendously. See y'all later.